Hey all, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're gonna be discussing and really trying to answer the question of what's the best value VPS provider with a real focus on the price to performance ratio. So I've been running my servers on a VPS, really my applications on a VPS, which is a virtual private server for the last year. And I recently switched over to an Ansible script for configuring my servers and their app deployments. And I say I've been doing this for the last year, but I've really been doing this on and off for various applications for the last five-ish years. But then the last year I've switched all of my apps over to these. And so can say that I'm more VPS native, I guess. And so I've done a fair bit of shopping around to figure out what the best VPS for my money is, because you know, if I'm going through the work of setting up a VPS, I want to run it for a while and get the benefits. I don't have to be like switching from thing to thing. And so ideally, whichever one I start off with is a good one for me long-term. And so I created Cloud Compare to help compare the different clouds offerings to make this decision easier. And I've recently discussed my recommendations with several people who have asked me questions about this. And so here I wanted to lay out that recommendation so that anyone can benefit. You can visit Cloud Compare at cloudcompare.xyz. We've got server pricing comparisons um, for different common compute configurations. Um, here we've also got egress costs um, and object storage, which we'll talk about um, in a minute. Okay, so what makes a VPS valuable? First, let's align our, on our definition of value with the VPS. It typically comes down to a few things. The first is, of course, cost. How much money you're paying out of pocket? Why would you pay $10 when you could pay $5 for the exact same thing? The next is performance. And this is gonna be how much hardware and performance you get for your money. Now, I wanna note that not all hardware is made the same and different configurations of the same hardware can severely impact performance, which together means that unfortunately, finding accurate benchmarks for this is very hard and actually creating accurate benchmarks is hard because you're gonna to have to test on the exact machine that you're running on um, and that's pretty hard to do at scale and at, and like make a profit off of that basically. The next is reliability, um, which is really how much uptime you have with that hardware and how fast or helpful support is when you need them. It really doesn't matter how good your hardware is if your machine is broken. So it's important that you know you have a good provider that can help you out here. So for this post, we're gonna mostly focus on cost with some anec data on performance and reliability to guide us because accurate benchmarks for these are pretty hard to find and produce. You have to look over long time periods. You have to look across all different configuration options. Um, you're gonna have to test quite a lot of those because even a small setup difference and then even if it's like a physical setup difference in a specific data center and a specific rack can make a large difference on your, your actual output. And so it's just hard to give good numbers here. And so we're just not going to, and we're just gonna provide generalizations for those. And so this is gonna provide us directionally accurate recommendations with the caveat that there are going to be outliers both good and bad that we may miss. Okay, let's start off with the best VPS providers for your money. In general, the VPSs that come out on top for price to performance ratios are Hetzner, Contabo, NetCup, and OVH Cloud. These generally went out in terms of the price for their CPU and RAM configurations and their benchmarks typically score favorably and support is generally helpful. Although again, with an asterisk, note that there's gonna be outliers here so we're kind of just making generalizations. They tend to score far better than the big three clouds like AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud as they're closer to bare metal. And so they can offer better prices for the hardware. Plus they don't nickel and dime you with add-on fees and have much cheaper egress costs, which is often one of the largest factors at scale for what your actual cloud bill is gonna be as we'll talk about later. All right, comparing VPS server prices. So VPS server prices are how much you'll pay for your server over the course of the month. These are often billed hourly, so you don't have to pay for the full month if you wanna spin up and spin down servers, but note that VPSs typically are slower to provision, often on the order of tens of seconds to minutes and sometimes hours if you're getting like a dedicated server somewhere. And so if you're planning on doing spin up, spin down to try and get like second based rates or something like that, um, probably serverless offerings are gonna be better for you. The real win for um, VPSs and bare metal is that over time for the hardware, they're often much cheaper than the serverless offerings because they're not paying for all the convenience fees and overhead. But that does come with the caveat that, you know, they're better for long-term things. They're a little bit slower to start up and set up. Um, and so that's the, kind of the trade-off you're playing there. So here's a screenshot of cloud compares server prices. We're going to be looking at medium for vCPUs and eight gigabyte RAMs or whatever the closest configuration they have is. And I pulled out a few that I want to talk about here. And so the linked cloud compares right here. Again, this is for vCPU, um, eight gigabyte RAM configuration. 
solutions. So you can see that Contabo is about $5 a month, Netcap $6, Hetzner $8, OBH Cloud $27, DigitalOcean $48, AWS $96, Google Cloud $144, and Azure $233 per month. And so as we can see, our leading clouds are mostly under $10 for this configuration with the big clouds over $100. And so that's 10x savings for a similar configuration just by going with um, our recommended clouds up here. Now we're going to be comparing VPS egress costs. So egress costs are how much you'll pay for data that leaves the cloud. An example would be a user hits your website and you return your web page to that user. The payload of the web page leaving the cloud is how much egress you've accumulated. For typical websites, this is often pretty light. I mean, I think my page here is like, I don't know, 25 kilobytes maybe. And so people hitting my page a lot isn't going to matter that much. But it can increase exponentially with high traffic, and especially if you get DDoSed or distributed denial of service, where they send thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of requests a second, which can really add up. Or if you're just serving um, heavy media like images or videos, depending on how you're sending out, that can really add up. Um, often clouds will charge you differently based on like the region, the data center, whether it's um, served via your server or your object storage. And so typically um, one of the reasons that, you know, VPS is especially on the more bare bones uh, clouds are, are better deals is because they don't nickel and dime you for those things. It's just like you pay for the egress and that's it. Um, so these are things to, to look out for. And so again, I've taken a screenshot of the VPS egress prices from Cloud Compare here, and you can get the link right here to visit it. Um, but I pulled out a few that I want to talk about. And so we can see that Contabo, NetCup, and OVH Cloud cost $0 per terabyte for egress. Hetzner costs $1 uh, per terabyte, Linode $5, DigitalOcean $10, and then Google Cloud, Azure, and AWS are all around $90. And then I have to put this one here to rag on them every single time I see this number. It's ridiculous. Netlify costs $550 per terabyte. And so as we can see, our top choices come in at about $0 to $1 per terabyte, whereas big clouds come in at $90. That's 90x savings on egress alone, and this doesn't even include all the random additional fees and comp applications of like, you know, which rating tier am I at? Where's it at kind of thing. And so much, much cheaper to go with our top choices. And in general, egress costs and ad hoc usage fees are what ends up financially ruining solo devs who get targeted with DDoS attacks. It's not the, you know, price on the tin that it looks like you're going to be paying. It's because all of these fees stack up when you're getting hit a thousand, tens of thousands, hundred thousands, millions of requests a second um, for an hour or more. As an example, here's a cautionary tale of a $100,000 cloud bill that a developer had to pay for their side project due to Netlify's very high egress costs. Again, $550 per terabyte, pretty ridiculous. Okay, and so the other question that usually accompanies people asking me for these recommendations is like, should you run a VPS? And my answer is really that it depends. The beauty of VPSs, I think, is that you are close to the bare metal server. And this means you get more hardware for your money, often netting 10x savings, if not more, if you add in the savings on the additional fees. Because going bare metal typically comes with less additional fees. For network usage, both egress and ingress, per request fees, additional volumes and object storage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Typically, the more convenient a thing is, the more that they abstract away from you, the higher those fees are going to be, and that's where they're making their margins. And so for dollar price, it's very, very hard to beat VPS and bare metal servers. Now, on the other hand, VPSs typically come with less guardrails. It's a private server that you have full access to, but you're also in charge of configuring it, locking it down so others can't hack it, and setting up your own workloads. Compare this to cloud and serverless offerings that typically have integrated workload runners, you know, like those things like Node, you just install the, I don't know, AWS package, and then you can just run it as like a function or whatever. That's not going to happen in VPSs and then advanced cloud consoles that can help configure a server via GUI. You know, this is going to be things like you don't have to SSH into the server and, you know, run your sudo commands. You can just click the buttons like, you know, enable SSH, block to this port, you know, that kind of thing. And I will note that most VPSs do have um, cloud consoles, but it's really bare bones. It's going to be able to allow you to create an emergency terminal. Um, you can rescue the box if like you're locked yourself out. Um, you can reflash it with a different Linux distro. You might be able to like turn the computer on and off, but you're not going to be able to do a lot of these configurations just via the console because that's just not what this cloud was built for. And so this means that you may be paying a different price, more in terms of time and effort. And so for some people, saving on money may make more sense. 
and for others, saving time and effort might make more sense. Personally, I find the server configurations interesting, and I like the control it provides me so that I can set up my servers and app deployments exactly as I want them. I'm not constrained to whatever options the cloud has. Um, I don't have to learn a new cloud UI every time. I don't have to like find workarounds because like they offer this option, but not this option. I control the servers, I can configure them exactly as I want. And so I choose a VPS and I use an infrastructure as code tool like Ansible to automate my configurations. But if you don't wanna go that low level, you also have in-between options where you run your own pass, which is a platform as a service. This is like what Google Cloud Platform, um, DigitalOcean App Platform, sorry, Google Cloud Run, AWS Fargate, et cetera. Those are all platforms as a services, Versal, Netlify, all those platforms as a services that you give the workload and they figure out how to run it. There is an in-between here so that you get the experience of a cloud on your own hardware. And so this often gives you, you know, the costs of your own hardware, but the experience of a cloud, which for many is actually the right balance for them. Some examples of this include Coolify, Portainer, Docu, Docploy, and Cap Rover, to name a few. There's a bunch, new ones spawn, you know, every now and then. So you might want to take a look at that. I personally use Coolify to manage my Docker deploys from GitHub and would highly recommend it if you don't want to go the Ansible route. I went the Ansible route because I wanted more control and I was comfortable with servers and the configurations and stuff. But for, I think, a lot of people um, going at this level is going to be a better balance. So I've been running my projects on VPSs solely for the past year and have really enjoyed it. I think it was scariest at first as I had to learn a lot and there weren't any familiar GUIs to help me out, especially when I went the Ansible route. But I've become more accustomed to the command line and I now find most server configurations easier and more straightforward via command line in Ansible than the bespoke and complicated UIs most clouds provide. I think it's funny that like, you know, it was Google Cloud, Azure, they make like so much money off of people who are, you know, hosting their stuff there and paying all of these extra fees and stuff. But the UIs are like often very hard and complicated to navigate and get the right thing set up. You have to like worry about random permissions and everything. And so while I think the server was like scary because you're like in the command line, it's like, am I doing this right? I don't know. I don't have that visual feedback. Um, once you get used to that, it's the same on every server. Whereas if you ever try to get into like one cloud to another, you know what you need to do, but it's like you have to refigure out a whole set of steps to like click through and set the right thing. And does it even do the same thing as it does on another cloud? I don't know. And so over time, I think it's just like honestly simpler um, for me to just do it with a raw server. Now, as for which cloud host I chose, I'm running Hetzner and I have had no problems with them so far. I'd highly recommend. And I even got servers from their server auction, which further improves my price to performance ratio. I should do a post on this, but the server auction basically auctions off servers and configurations from previous generations. But, and they often come with like much higher um, volume storage attached. And so you end up being able to get a slightly older server computer that will still last you, you know, many years. Um, but at a steep discount because it's just not the current gen. And so I was able to knock off another like 40% on the price I would pay for these servers. And so instead of like the 90% discount, I'm now getting like a 94% discount basically. If you're interested in trying Hetzner, you can sign up with my referral link to get $20 in free cloud credits. So if you've been looking for a sign, maybe this is your sign to try it out. That said, I do think any of the top recs here will be fine for most people. Hetzner is known to be a bit shrewd in who they let into the platform. They like require your IDs. They take a few days to like get back to you. And they will also kick people off if they think that you're violating their terms. And so if they deny you, which does happen to some people, um, I think the other top choices will work just as well. So I don't think you're really missing out on anything. I just personally prefer Hetzner. If you like this post, you might also like how Cloudflare container pricing compares to other container serverless container offerings like Google Cloud Run, AWS Fargate, Azure Container Apps, Railway, DigitalOcean App Platform, and Heroku Dynos, to name a few. You might also be interested in how I was hosting with Coolify, hosting my Docker containers on a VPS with Coolify as a platform as a service with GitHub auto deploys. And finally, why I'm ditching Coolify for Ansible for deploying my web apps, which is kind of my journey from, you know, starting on clouds to moving to Coolify on my own BPS to finally deciding to configure my own servers. And in particular, some ideas on, you know, if it's right for you and when you might want to consider moving off of Coolify or one of these paths to actually configure your own servers. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.